Biomechanics of Fractures and Fixation. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Michael Kane. Uh, I'm Sakib Rahman narrating, and we already discussed basic biomechanics in the uh, first video, and uh, we are now going to pick up on the biomechanics of fractures. So um, we think about the terms we used in the last video um, and now apply it to bone. Ban bone is anisotropic, uh, so the direction of the load matters. So it's stiffer depending on how you load the bone, and therefore it'll fail easier uh, in certain directions. So um, bone is also, also viscoelastic, so trabecular bone will become stiffer with compression. Um, bone is weakest in shear. So bone is basically strongest in com under compression loads, uh, a little bit weaker when it comes to tension loads. So it's going to fail first under tension, then compression under the same amount of load. And it's the weakest under shear loads. So um, if you think about diaphyseal bone, it's a hollow cylinder and has those type of properties. Um, cortical bone is less porous than trabecular bone. And uh, you know, porosity affects the stiffness and strength of uh, trabecular bone. So a fracture essentially is a result of a bone being loaded to failure. Uh, the magnitude and direction of the force can vary, and then different patterns are associated with different magnitudes and directions, and different bones are going to fail differently. So for example, um, or I should say they fail differently under typical circumstances. So a transverse patella fracture is typically a tension failure. Um, a vertebral body uh, fracture is typically a compression failure and often called a compression fracture. And a tibia uh, in this example is shown as a torsional failure. So you have rotational stresses that uh, exceed um, um, the bone's material properties, then you can develop a fracture in that direction. So there are different types of fracture patterns that we'll see. Uh, in a transverse fracture, the force is perpendicular to the long axis of the bone. In a spiral fracture, it's due to torsional force. In an oblique fracture, uh, the force is somewhat diagonal to the axis of bone. And there's three types, axial bending and axial, torsional and bending. And a lot of oblique fractures will occur due to um, compression loads. A butterfly fracture is a combination of a bending force and a compression force. So bending force typically happens on the you know, tension side, and then the sort of two fracture lines uh, helping to form the butterfly fragment or the wedge fragment uh, due, are due to compression force on the opposite side. And then comminuted fractures are usually high energy. So here are some examples of you know, transverse Fracture being loaded in the direction of the arrows being shown here. Um, so if you do this, you are going to uh, fail in tension over here first, where I'm, I'm showing on that uh, essentially lateral cortex of the tibia. And then the fracture will then propagate across uh, in that direction. So that's typically how that failure would occur. Uh, pure compression, for example, can cause failure here at the uh, metaphyseal uh, level, as you can see, uh, causing crush injury, like in a pilon fracture. Uh, you can also see a combination of compression and bending, causing an oblique fracture in the mid shaft of the tibia. Uh, sometimes with torsion, you can get a little bit more of a spiral type fracture, as shown here. Um, if you have forces such as compression and bending, uh, you will fail in tension at this cortex first, and then this side will be loaded under compression and will form these fracture lines, and you get this sort of wedge or butterfly fracture. Uh, and then a rotational force will cause a spiral type fracture. Now, if we think about osteoporosis, uh, the trabecular bone becomes more porous. Um, you have uh, essentially two main challenges. You have less dense bone, so there's a risk of fractures from just activities of daily living, low energy falls. Uh, and then from a surgeon's standpoint, uh, there's a limited ability to get good fixation because the bone's not dense or implants don't hold as well, right? So these are some of the biomechanical considerations for the patient as well as the surgeon.
So with osteoporosis, bones become brittle and fragile because of loss of tissue, loss of bone density. Um, and uh, fracture resistance of osteoporotic bone is a function of the third power of bone mineral density. And um, cortical bone becomes very thin uh, as well. Let's talk about stress risers. So uh, a defect in bone or sudden change in stiffness results in a stress riser. So we think about things at the end of an implant. So here you can see there is some kind of intramedullary stem and there's a sudden change in stiffness uh, at the end of that stem where you have bone and metal and then suddenly there's uh, less stiffness beyond that. So periprosthetic fractures, interprosthetic fractures, peri-implant fractures, meaning a fracture uh, next to a fracture implant doesn't have to be a prosthetic joint replacement. So um, use the terms carefully. Uh, a bone defect, just like a cyst, for example, um, or a, a metastatic lesion, for example, can result in a stress riser. So if we think about periprosthetic fractures, uh, these can often happen from low energy injuries. Um, you can have... Um, and Vancouver classification, we're not going to cover that in detail here. Um, but uh, needless to say, uh, torsional forces at the end of a um, um, at the end of a stem, and including the stem as shown here, can uh, can cause a periprosthetic fracture. Uh, the presence of a hip prosthesis itself can decrease the strength of the femur by thirty two percent, and then a loose implant can increase the risk of periprosthetic fracture. So what about fractures in between two different um, uh, prosthetics, total hip and a total knee, exam for example? Um, well, the, ra the risk of fracture goes up um, depending on how close they are uh, to each other. So you want to sort of distance them as much as possible. Depends also on cortical thickness and if the implant is loose. What about peri-implant or sort of like fractures at the end of your plate and screw construct. Uh, well, the risk is a little lower if you have an unlocked screw, because the screw can probably toggle a little bit, as opposed to a locked screw, where you have very increased stiffness. Uh, a unicortical screw is going to be less stiff, so uh, and that lowers the strength of the bone compared to bicortical. And um, angled screws can potentially uh, decrease pullout and fracture risk. Uh, and um, if you have two plates, let's say a bicondylar tibial plateau fracture, um, one strategy you can do is have the plates different lengths, right? So they don't end at the exact same spot, and then you have this big stress riser to create some overlap, essentially, where one plate then goes longer than the other one. So here, this is interesting, it shows the loads required to cause a femur fracture, and you can see that as you go from the intact femur on the left to just the total hip in the middle to then having a total nip, uh, total hip, I'm sorry, above a short retrograde nail, you can see the the force required to cause this fracture here is much lower than it is to cause a fracture in the intact femur. When you have bone defects, and here's an example when you like remove plates and screws, for example, you're going to have bone defects. The risk of fracture increases. So bending, torsional fo uh, forces can cause risk. Um, it depends on how big that is. And uh, if you have a very small um, hole um, that represents less than 10% of the diameter, the risk might be much lower. But as you get to larger defects, then there's a linear uh, decrease uh, in relation to the size in terms of how much force is required to cause a fracture. So let's talk a little bit about bone healing and biomechanics. So we talked about bone, what about bone healing? Well, there are two types of healing for bone. One is secondary bone healing. This is sort of the natural bone healing that occurs when a fracture is left alone or if it's treated in a cast or if it's treated with you know, relative stability like an intramedullary nail as opposed to primary bone healing, which is what you get with compression plating. So um, there are, with the natural bone healing, there's four stages. There's sort of this inflammatory stage where you have a hematoma. Then you have the uh, callus phase, which is also broken up into a soft callus and a hard callus phase. And then there's a remodeling phase. And this is where you get 
you know, callus formation and you're, you're sort of looking for that on your x-ray. And um, with primary bone healing, this is a situation you only really get when you anatomically reduce a fracture and then compress it. So in this case, there's theoretically no callus um, formed and you have um, these cutting cones that go directly across the fracture and remodel directly. So you don't go through all those phases. So um, if we, you know, if you think about like what happens over time, the ultimate tensile strength of your fracture with secondary bone healing is going to increase over time. You go from this hematoma, the soft callus, hard callus, and eventually remodels, um, and you get sort of mature bone over time. So here are those phases again, where you have an inflammatory phase, where you have a clot, then you have granulation tissue that stabilizes, and then you have calcified cartilage and hard callus, followed by um, you know, the normal biomechanics being experienced by the bone allows for remodeling, and then sometimes the volume of that callus can decrease a little bit. So optimal interfragmentary motion is 0.2 to 1 millimeters. That is, if you're a you know, bone cell trying to form bone and you're experiencing more motion than that, um, that can potentially um, uh, disrupt healing. Now, if you have uh, you know, too little motion, that can be a problem as well. Uh, so there is a balance here. Um, Healing typically occurs peripherally. So you typically get this hematoma, you get periosteal callus formation, um, and most importantly, um, shear. If we remember that you know, bone is uh, weakest under shear, and if we have shear, um, this can help, this can really prevent bone healing. So an example is shown here. Um, if you have shearing, this can lead to instability that uh, can prevent bone from forming uh, and instead getting you know, just uh, soft tissue formation as shown by Perrin strain theory. Now with primary bone healing, uh, we get anatomic reduction and compression. You get immediate, immediate stability of very little motion and there's really no gap. Uh, it's a slower process, but you get direct bone healing. You kind of bypass the callus phase. And microscopically, you're going to see these osteoclasts directly cutting across the fracture, osteoblast forming bone, and uh, you get lamellar bone that forms. It takes longer. This is only achieved if you do compression plate fixation. And uh, when we do this, you have to be careful not to remove implants too early if there's a reason you have to. Um, Think about uh, delaying if you can, because refractures can occur because it's difficult to really know and assess how mature that is. You really can't identify it very well radiographically. Now, when we talk about non-unions and delayed unions, um, this is something co covered in a different lecture, uh, but... Um, Sometimes a fracture will not heal because there's too much motion or it's unstable. And this can lead to a hypertrophic nonunion where the body's making bone, but it literally just doesn't have, or the motion hasn't been limited enough for bone to cross across the fracture gap. And you just get all this sort of uh, callus without bridging. And there's too much motion. Sometimes if you have too little motion, that can cause a nonunion as well. Um, so if you have a gap, and it's very, very rigid and stiff, um, you're not going to be able to form any callus, and you're also not going to get primary bone healing, and that can lead to an atrophic nonunion. And sort of striking this balance is um, what we're trying to do. All right, well, we're going to pause here, and in the next video, we'll pick up with fixation strategies.